Hello. Um, welcome to the B&H uh, event space. Um, my name is Norma Quintana, Norma I. Quintana. Um, I wanted to dedicate this talk, um, actually, to about over 100 people who lost their lives in the 2017-2018 California fire. Um, I'm here to tell you a story. And it's a story that I hope is about not a story that defines you, but is a story of transformation. So the last time I was here, um, I spoke about maybe less than four years ago. And I spoke about my 10-year journey um, following a traveling One Ring American Circus. And so for 10 years, I pr practically joined a circus to my family's horror. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up um, thinking I was just going to photograph them, like a lot of people do with their cameras, and they want to uh, document um, the people's lives or what they see, as we do all the time. But in my case, I just went back, and then I went back. And then for 10 summers, I photographed um, a one ring circus. I am known as, well, m my experience has been with just analog photography, old school. Um, st I'm essentially self-taught. Um, while I have a background and master's in justice, um, I decided um, pretty late in my life, m in my, in my uh, early 40s, to pursue photography. And pursue photography, um, not as an H word, but as an actual calling or really dedicated to uh, photography. And part of that um, was um, it involved me shooting um, 35 primarily, and, and then I went to a medium format camera. And always available light, um, holding my Hasselblad. And that's what I sh shot with. So the, this journey um, initially took me um, to many places and meeting these incredible people um, and um, even, for example, this image I shot, um, it's of a little, um, it was a little girl that was with her mother and now this little girl is, it's interesting about, about social media because I, I follow her now and she's 17 years old and does not look at all like this little girl. Um, I found myself photographing, again, uh, very organically, um, people, kids, um, and so that led me to, um, again, um, photographing and found myself really um, dedicating myself to studying photography. I studied with some of you may know um, Mary Ellen Mark. I just took classes with uh, Graciela Iturbide. And so I pretty much um, um, kind of learned my craft of photography. Always film, always um, available light, and always no tr with no tripod. And what, and this is one of my, one of my favorite images of, of one of the circus people. And so what that did is it led me to working on a book, which is, I think, a lot of people's uh, dream, possibly. If you create work, you would like to have a book. And, um, and the short story there is that I found myself knowing that I wanted a beautiful book crafted, but, and then concerned myself with the publisher. And it turned out that I was able to um, get the, um, the notice of Yolanda Cuomo, who's an incredible book designer. And then from there, it led to an Italian publisher. So Circus of Traveling Life is a book I have now um, done by uh, Damiani um, uh, in, in Italy. And so that led me to having exhibitions, more exhibitions. And so I knew that for, um, for a long time, I was going to really be speaking about this body of work. And so my toolbox was a Hasselblad that I bought here at B&H. 
Um, and my film was Triax, which still exists. Thank you very much. Um, and um, and then, of course, the um, the dark room, which is something that I think some people still have. Anybody here have a dark room? Right. So it's still present. So that just gives you a little history about me. You know, somebody's self. No. Yeah, too many enlarges. No, it was just an image. Um, and um, so that was kind of my history. So again, um, somebody who decided to pretty much pursue uh, the analog world. Sorry. So on October 8th, everything changed. Um, I don't even know where to start. I mean, um, my husband's here, by the way, Sergio, uh, who's my, my, my mate. And so um, what's, what's interesting is that um, on the 8th of October, I live in Northern California, and um, everybody was you know, in bed, and about pretty late at night on October 8th, um, I got a call from a very good friend who called, and you know, oftentimes you get a call, and then the second time you're like, okay, they're gonna leave a message, and then the third time when they call you, they wanna talk to you. So this person calls me and said, hey, listen, Norma, there's a fire behind you. And I said, w what are you talking about? What a fire. So I go out, and um, I found myself going to the back of the house and didn't see anything. And so we continued to go back, and we still didn't see anything. And what was, um, what was surprising to us is that we didn't smell anything. There were no fire um, um, fires. There weren't, uh, there weren't any helicopters, all the things that you would expect when a fire occurs. And so at this point, we're still not thinking anything's going on. And so we ended up walking behind our, uh, in another part of the, of the neighborhood. And we saw that there was a fire. But you know, I, I don't know if you know, but in, in Cal Northern California particularly, um, really all of California, it's pretty dry. And there are fires. But they're always contained. So one of the things that happened was that uh, that night, um, we ended up um, we ended up basically going back to the house thinking the grid's going to come down. And he is here, they probably sh uh, sh uh, shut down the grid if it's too hot and everybody has their air conditioners there. They turn them off. If there's a fire, it's off. Or um, I think generally that's the case. Anyway, so we ended up um, right after that coming back to the house thinking we were just going to pack our things, not even pack our things, just stay home. And actually. Um, ironically, we were going to stay in the house. We were going to hide from all the people telling us to leave because in the past it's happened. And so they, they want you to leave, but we decided we're going to hunker down and stay. But immediately there were people at the door and they said, you need to leave now. It was, ver it was you know, um, it was, and we were asking them, well, what's going on? We still don't see a fire. And they said, a fire is coming. And so we were highly irritated, by the way. And we thought, um, well, why don't we just, you know, take whatever we have and our computer and um, our phones. I had to wake up my teenager. I had to wake up my, um, my mother-in-law, who was with us, who's elderly. And we all got together, and we all left to go to my husband's office, thinking, I'll just be right back. So. One of the things that happened was we ended up going back to my husband's office. And we were at the office. Um, we immediately saw we'd go back home the next day. And so we didn't sleep. But we woke up. And I'm, you know, we were literally planning to go back. And then, um, and then my husband gets a call from a text. Oh, and by the way, the phones weren't working. I don't know if the news ever got to, to New York, because believe it or not, people were trying to get on Facebook, because we did not hear anything on our end. Everything was shut down. So my husband gets a text, and I see that he just got pretty blank. And I thought, well, what's going on? And he's like, it's not good. And I went, what do you mean? And so he showed me um, the, um, it was the, 
part of our fireplace in the driveway. And, and this is what we ended up seeing. And, and as a visual artist, I can't even begin to tell you, like, h how do you negotiate a loss like that? I mean, you just, you know, in, in a period of probably just hours, everything we owned, everything we had was burned. With it, and in less than 24, if you would have said, oh, your house is going to burn down, we would have never, I would have said, how is that possible? I mean, it was, it was, you know, we're very fortunate. We had a big house. It was made of stucco. It had a fire, protect, you know, um, a roof that had the protection. So we, I started to just look, and we just couldn't find, any, uh, we couldn't find anything, like anything that resembled anything, like you say, your refrigerator. I knew ephemera would not. Uh, exist. I knew that things would not exist. Like, um, I didn't even think about my photos. I didn't think about my art books. I didn't think about my dark room. I didn't think about my negatives. I didn't think about anything. Because it's, you know, it's one of those things where I think, you know, w w it, it's, it, I don't even know what I, I would call it. It wasn't even shock. You just don't go there because you can't process it. Yes. Well, no. Actually, what's really interesting, I, you know, uh, somebody can maybe who knows about fires. Um, it was really the strangest um, event because the house across us didn't burn, but the houses next to us burned, and then you go like two or three houses later, and then another one would burn, but then not the other one, and so there was no rhyme or reason. It wasn't like somehow our house was, you know, somebody else's house was more fireproof because there were houses that were older, made out of wood, and, did, and didn't get burned. And so it just kind of jumped. It was one of those fires that just jumped around. Uh, now, there were neighborhoods later in this fire. We had at least seven fires, so there was a word immediately, like maybe it was arson. Um, um, a lot of people don't like California, so I'm, we're thinking maybe this is something, is something you know, um, organized. And there were neighborhoods north, not north of us, on the other side um, in Sonoma, where the entire neighborhood was burned down, like an actual neighborhood. In our case, we were in a hill, so, um, so it, it that burned, but then three other houses did not burn. So. We, um, you could not, uh, you know, one of the things that people don't understand is that when a fire occurs, you're not allowed to go back at all. They totally shut down. You can't go back. Um, I mean, some people were able to come back if you, that if you um, had a pet and it was missing. And actually, what's, what's really sad is a lot of the people, that, some of the people that died were people who had pets because they wouldn't leave. They wouldn't leave their pet, which I understand if you're looking and it's, it's so, um, and this image is of, of our, our table, I call it our gathering table. Um, we've had many, many people in photography and we've celebrated many, many things and it was, and, and this is, was made out of steel, so that was the only thing that survived was that table. I mean, it got pretty charred. So what I found myself doing, of course, is, um, I remember at one point I thought, you know, it was just oddly beautiful. And I know that that's strange, but I started to see the light. And I think as a photographer, and if you're, most of you are photographers, you realize you start following the light. You start looking. And, I, and maybe because of the smoke, it was very filtered light. So I started to look, and one of the things that I had was um, I had probably some... I had a huge collection of about a lot of things, and one of them was typewriters. And I was just so excited just to find this typewriter. I knew it was a typewriter, but I thought, oh my God, there it is. Because then what I did is people knew 
that we I had all these things and they everybody says oh did you find your valuables and it's like that's not what you find in a fire you don't find I don't know people were saying did you have a wedding ring I said no I lost that you you don't really find anything but in my case I went back because I wanted um, to sift through the rubbish and um, you and we ended up having people you start getting the masks and you start getting all your things and so here's a table what I did is I put anything I would find you might recognize some of the things of parts of cameras because what I did also is I had a huge collection of cameras and so they were all lined up in my studio and you know they've been around for a hundred years some of the parts are here for um, a long time so what I started to do was starting to pick um, you know slowly but surely parts so I started to just photograph and so the only camera I had was I'll do that one was my iPhone that was it that's the only camera I had and I had I didn't have that many cameras that I would use. I, prim I pr primarily had a, my Hasselblad, and I had a couple of really not great 35 millimeters. But it was really the iPhone was the only camera. But I wasn't thinking that it was my camera. You know, it was just I had it, and I used it. As you all probably do, we all do, and sometimes we're burdened by it because we don't want to use it, and then, but you find yourself that it's really pretty easy to use the camera. And this particular camera that I had just gotten, I mean, it's insane with the, with the light. I mean, it just picks up a lot of different things. So, so what I did is, I, somehow I decided, someone said, you need to start writing, Norma. Just write. And I'm not a writer. I'm more of a visual person. So I found myself tagging Forge from Fire. That's, that's what I'm doing. I'm foraging. I'm foraging. So I started to forage, and then I'm not even an Instagram person, but I found myself putting it on Instagram. And I think it was just my way of communicating to people. Just I started on Instagram. And then when I was on Instagram, um, I started to get calls um, from, for example, um, in San Francisco was the, the, um, the art, um, um, the art, not the curator, but the art critic. And so, because there were so many fires, I think they were trying to find, I think people, as you know in the press, are trying to find a story. So they, were, they, they see my work on, on Instagram, and so they start calling me because they want to know, what are you doing? What is this? And it was in that inquiry that I started to, um, to sense that maybe I had something to say. But again, it wasn't part of my plan. It was more instinctually what I did, which is to start documenting and foraging some of the things. And so I started by doing this whole uh, tray series. And basically, um, I remember finding this pretty banged up box. And I got pretty excited because I thought, well, maybe something's in there. Because you keep thinking you're going to find something. I, I, I don't know if you've um, you know, have had that experience where you're looking and you're looking and you're looking. And once you find it, you get so excited about it. But anyway, so I, had, I started to just photograph. Again, it was on the floor. I started to photograph um, on the ground. And then the media starts picking it up. And so the newspapers, all the newspapers wanted to reach out to me. and. Um, and the film crew and CNN and that sort of thing. And so I immediately started um, to then start, it, it, it was interesting, I, I tend to, I'm not a photographer every day, I don't shoot every day. Actually, I'm pretty hard on myself because I always feel like I have to be like all those people that photograph and create work all the time. But I do have a general philosophy is that I photograph when I have something to say. When you have something to say, not something to see, but something to say, 
that's when I start photographing. And so using that whole analog philosophy for me works, which is image by image by image, not image, 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 900 images, but create one. So one of the things that I had was I had that glove, which everybody had to have gloves because it's pretty toxic. And, um, and I had my mask. And I started to photograph my memories, my history, my things, the things I loved. So for me, when I see this image, it represents a memory. It doesn't represent a thing. It represents a memory. I can tell you that it was given to me on, a birth at, um, on one of my birthdays. I can tell you that it was the color uh, of green. I can tell you the day she gave me this present. Um, I can tell you that they were Chinese. I can tell you that they were lacquer. I can tell you many, many things where I, I wore them. So I started to realize that because everybody would ask, how are you doing? I can't believe, how do you feel about losing everything? Followed by something you probably should never tell somebody who loses everything, which is, it's just stuff. <laughs> Please don't say that to anybody. Because it isn't just stuff. Even though I know in this Western culture we're burdened, I mean, I think about New Yorkers, all of you, who are in smaller spaces and you have things and then you have to realize like what am I going to do with all these books and all these things what am I going to do with all my um, images my negatives my cameras what I say to you is embrace it embrace it and enjoy it because you're living with your memories you're living with your life it's not a horrible thing but I know we get burdened because we think that we need to get rid of them or they're in the way. And sometimes they're just not in the way. They're just a reflection of your, of your life. You now, sometimes you think, well, it's a very disorganized life. But when you're creative and you have memories and you have relationships, you have objects. So of course, I found the reels of my vintage cameras because they're beautiful. And there were so many of them. And so I just started to, I don't know, my husband can attest. I mean, I think I, when all the chaos, because it was chaos, and we were homeless, which is, I've never been homeless. And I come from a pretty scrappy background. I'm an inner city Puerto Rican girl from Ohio. And so I have never been homeless. And I was homeless with a teenager, with a older uh, mother-in-law. but. Somehow, we just negotiated through, and we found ourselves supported by our friends. And so for three months, we were not in a home. But we were in a home. But while that was happening, I had my iPhone, and I would go back to the property. So the left image is, of course, doll parts. And then the right image on my screen is of ephemera. And I got very excited because I couldn't believe that, that the actual paper survived, but it was wedged in somewhere. So I found myself just pulling maybe um, a metal uh, container, opening it up, and getting very excited about the fact that that was a book that I had, a small, very small book. And the left was um, pretty intense, but beautiful. Again, I started to find kind of beauty in them. And oddly enough, um, you know, on Facebook um, and in the social media platform, people just started to reach out to me and either sharing their own story of their home burning when they were, when they were young. Or um, I remember one person uh, said, I live in New York. I know um, it's far away from you, but if you need a place, you can stay with us. A stranger. I started to get film, actual rolls of film. Um, people start, it's a private message, they started to send me um, their books because I'm a book collector. I, I have an art book and so I started to collect, um, people started to send me their books um, and work. 
And one person sent me a small box, and I thought, who is this? And didn't really have a, uh, I didn't know the person very well. And when I saw the box, I opened it up, and it was a small box, and she said, I want you to have some of my favorite things. And it was from her travels in Europe and Italy and that sort of thing. And so I began to realize that, that, that you know, during the time these days with politics, it was so dark and it's so divided and so ugly. And this is a time, in spite of the fact that it was such a big tragedy, there was, some, there was a lot of love, a lot of people reaching out. I thought that was really beautiful. For, uh, for me, it was very beautiful that that had happened. Then I find this, and I thought, what is that? Because you often find objects, I thought it was beautiful, obviously it's the shape of a heart. Um, and my husband is a heart doctor, so I said, what is this? And he goes, I, have, I think I know. And it was a CO2 canister from his bike. So it exploded and it came in that shape. So now it's a pin, I made a pin out of it. And then, like everything else, we would look for everyday objects. And again, all, they all have um, you know, a story. They all have a purpose. And some of you know these cameras. I, I believe that's a land camera. And then I would find things. Um, we adopted a little girl from China, so we had this huge collection of things from China. And so those were some of those objects. And then again, I started to post, and all of a sudden, I start getting approached. And so in our community, there's a place called the Railroad Art District. And so they approached me and said, would you mind if we put some of your work up? And I thought, OK. And so initially when they said, um, let's put some of your work up, they said, oh, can, can you reshoot them? Because you see, we need to have them in a certain format for this project. And I thought, no, I can't reshoot them. And they're like, well, you know, they do better if we, and so I started to realize that people were trying to make my work or try to present the work that I had shot with my iPhone um, to, um, to their needs, and, and I'm sure that happens a lot. Oftentimes you do your work and somebody else will tell you to do it a different way when in fact, you know, stay the course. And in my, in my case, the, the images were not consistent, so if you tend to be somebody that likes everything to be perfect or right on target, what I would suggest to you is go, you know, start embracing wabi-sabi start embracing that it's not going to be perfect. That remember, the thing is, it's not, it's, you're trying to say something. You're not, no one's going to sit and, and say, well, your picture is out of focus, or soft, as they say. Um, do, do you know what I mean? That I found myself really staying with, and remember, I'm an, I'm, I've only done analog, so I was definitely out of my comfort zone, definitely out of my comfort zone. I didn't know what I was doing. Oh, and it's also color. And I don't shoot in color. So then it begins where I start getting picked up by the media. Um, and people, it's so interesting, people will say, how did you even, how did you get, how did you get picked up, as they call it, picked up? And I said, you know, it's, I think it's one of those things in life, and this is my big, you know, takeaway and, you know, my big uh, pitch, I guess, is that, you know, we all worry about the work. We all are ambitious and want to do a lot of different things. I once heard from Graciela Iturbide, who told me, she gave me the best, one of the best advice, and she said, just remember, Norma, there's always time. And I never understood it until then. But she said, there's always time for what you need to happen eventually in your life. And so I just took those words. Um, so that group of images became 
a body of work. I wasn't, that wasn't the plan. I didn't think it was a body of work because I shot it with my iPhone. And I don't know how that was going to translate into something to be seen. I mean, the only thing I used to see was on my phone. And I don't know anybody, if anybody here has done work on iPhone. Has anybody done some work on the iPhone? But, um, and so when I started to want to see them bigger, I thought they were just going to be tiny little images. And so I found out pretty quickly through somebody who was an analog photographer who happens to have a, um, a dark room and a wet room and a dark and a dry room they call it? Dry room. Um, and he's like, oh, no problem. We can make these bigger. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? I mean, how can they be bigger? And he said, eh, no problem. Send me the raw. And I'm like, what does raw mean? <laughs> I mean, I, none of the, it was like learning a different language. And I can speak Spanish. And I, I, I was, I cannot tell you how, I, th I'm always, I think I was almost more uncomfortable with that experience than trying to get it together and start a life and, and be with my, my kids and finding a home. I was very uncomfortable. I did not know what was going on. But from that came a, 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 a beautiful exhibition that was gifted to me um, literally one year later at San Francisco Camera Work. Does anybody here know where Camera Work in San Francisco? It's, um, it's an epicenter. It's, it's got a lot of history. It's the kind of place I want to be seen at, I go see work at. Um, very dedicated to photography, fine art photography, um, to storytellers. And so they approached me and said, you know, we'd like you to do a show. And I thought, well, I don't have anything. And then they kept saying, well, you know, whatever you can do. And then uh, pretty much in about, about a period of about a month, I said, I think I can fill your exhibition space, which was very, very big. And one of the things, I don't know if you can see, is a typewriter. You see the typewriter? So what I did is I created this installation with the typewriter. And that's the only thing that I, that I you know, that's one of the things that I, that I kept. And then I made an, an image of the typewriter. And again, didn't think it was going to be an image but it became an image. And then I started to, there was just a lot of interest. And I think that, uh, that I think that, you know, people could relate to loss, but they were wondering how, how I was doing. They were wondering, what does it feel like? Because I think when there is a tragedy, people, you sit, you know, in their shoes. I mean, you sit in their space. You begin to understand. You start to think, well, if that happened to me. And so um, in the middle of the space, I did a, 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 a table. And in that table, I put some objects. Because somehow, I felt that people um, wanted to see what I saw. They don't, you know, with the news, as you all know, you see it. And that's it. And then it's the next cycle. And it's all about you know who. And it's also about you know politics. But the news cycle is so fast. And so, I mean, did people realize the damage uh, in New York about California? Oh, yeah, all right. There was in some of the press, but it wasn't like it was in the West Coast. So I, I always wondered, did people realize that people lost their lives? That there was so much destruction, you know, in, in, in California. Um, and so I remember thinking that if I'm going to do a show, so, so what? Uh, you know, I started to question myself. I mean, if I'm doing this body of work, what does it mean? OK, so I show you some things in a glove, on a glove. And so I really had to sit with the work and just, just just show you what I had. And I think collectively it was very powerful for a lot of people and very emotional for a lot of people. Because we all have had jewelry. We've all had kitchen things. We've all had cameras. Um, so in a lot of ways, it's 
your story as well as mine. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, what did I lose? Um, in terms of loss, I lost all of it. Um, but I have to say that luckily my negatives of the circus work and the negatives of another body of work that I'll show you later were still, are still with this fine art printer in Portland. Oh, good. Right. But that's not the, it, it, it's interesting, um, that's not, I didn't worry about that. Um, I, and I know your question because it's, it was my life's work, right? right? Uh, or people would say, do you have a hard drive? Well, unless you remember you have a hard drive, you're not going to leave with a hard drive if it's an emergency. Do you know what I mean? And so um, I didn't have backup. Um, even if I had backup, it wasn't something I thought about it. Do you know what I mean? I think now people know if there is a fire, if you have to run out of the house. But you think about that maybe a couple of times in your life, you don't think about it. I mean, life is too, you know, present. But, um, but I did lose um, all the, fo I, when I would sell a photograph, I would buy a photograph because I wanted my money to go back to art. And so I had, you know, Mary Ellen Mark Prince, Sally Mann. Um, I've had a lot of art books. I buy every art book I can. I'm a believer of supporting the artists and especially art books because they're limited edition. Um, I lost, I had a, a number of art books myself and the publisher all of a sudden one day I get this, you know, huge, you know, like five boxes and they were all um, my books that they wanted me to have. So those acts were just, I mean, I'm telling you, I think that's what really su supported me. A lot of photographers actually came to my house from, like, from Mother Jones and friends just came just to say something. And that's the other thing is I would advise that sometimes we feel powerless when things happen and you don't know what to do. And what I say to people is just do one thing. Just do one thing. You don't do anything else. Just do one. And don't ask them. Never ask somebody. Just do it. It's, it's really interesting. I learned that. I learned that um, because I'm very proud and I didn't want to ask for anything. I don't, I don't want to ha you know, ask for somebody for a you know, place to sleep or, or for film or for a book. But people started to give me things and I think that that was, I've I learned so much from that. But I've always, I've always thought that people were pretty wonderful and cool. But, so, but this was an opportunity, and the show was given to me by the director of San Francisco Camera Work, and she reached out to me immediately and said, listen, we see that you lost everything. Can we do a GoFundMe or that sort of thing? And I thought, no, 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 I don't, I don't want that. I said, you know what, let me just think about it. And so then she, we talked again, and she said, how about a show? And I said, how, yeah, that would work. And so I was really happy about that. And then it gave an opportunity for a lot of people to come to the show to see what was going on and to, and to, uh, to see how I was doing. And it was, it was fascinating to see people's interest even in the things that were lost. I think that they got what I was doing, which was just to show you these objects. Because I think that if you're curious, you may want to see them. Now, I have to say, there were some people that would say, you know, why are you doing that? Or why does she go back? I mean, it must be, that must be terrible. There are people who never have gone back to their sites. They just don't want to go there. And I could see that. I think some, I could see that happening. So the other thing that's happening, and it may be happening here, is that there was a lot of like, response to the whole thing of climate change. And so I started to get contacted by some curators about just cli in general cl climate change. They saw that I had a story to tell. And so um, I, I was in a museum show um, called Art Response. And it, I was the only one that actually had her, her whole world destroyed by the fire. Other people witnessed it or photographed it. So I think it was very personal for a lot of people, and so I, um, I had shown that. 
Um, and so people um, would, you know, continue to ask me um, about the work. Now, um, it was interesting that, like I said, to me the process of making the print was probably, like I said, one of the hardest things. Um, I learned a lot about digital printing. I learned a lot about, well, I still don't know as much about the digital world. Do some, do you shoot digital here? Well, everybody, yeah. I mean, if you have a phone, you're shooting digital. Um, I think I, maybe it took a disaster to drag me into digital. <laughs> I don't know, but, um, um, but I'm going to go back to my, my analog. It's just the way I see, it's the way. Is there a question? Oh, no, no, no. Oh. I'm, I'm, yeah. No, I had, I had to go digital because I couldn't afford to film anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was living in New York City, you know. Right. It's 300 bucks a day on film. I couldn't even, right. no way it could ever happen. Right. I, I, I just was going into debt buying giant things in film. Like of course. Of also, sometimes when you get to the 60-year-old film in your desk, it gets developed and just overwhelmed too. You know? Right, so yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. The digital world it has the same effect for me in the sense that it overwhelms me. I, even digitally, I don't shoot that much. I just shoot it, and I'm like, I got it. I mean, I don't even know about Photoshop. I mean, I know people who do it, and I would be, I would embrace it. I don't. I think it's like they're like tools, right? It's like, again, I think my story is about really telling people or sharing my story that. Here's this person who was, you know, essentially self-taught, but you know, learned from the, some of the great, the great women in photography, particularly. Um, really embraced the whole analog. Never judged the digital world at all, because people ask me, why do you, you know, you don't shoot digital? Um, and I said what I need to say in a digital world with these small prints and the iPhone, uh, iPhone. Um, and also. What I also learned, and I learned that a long time ago when, when I went to one of these portfolio reviews that somebody always gives you this little nugget of wisdom. And in that wisdom, I remember a woman who knew I had children, who knew I was trying to say what I needed to say. And she said, you know, you don't have to do it alone. Because you're, you're, I was trained as a, in a very pure way about, you know, you know it's, like, it's like, God forbid, smoking a cigarette and you rolled your own cigarettes. You know, it was like the same with film. You rolled your film. you you developed your film, you shot your film, and you went to the darkroom and you made your print. And that was so crazy and time consuming that I think that I started to embrace having somebody who could develop my film and, and print my work consistently. And thank God she um, is alive and well, former New Yorker, and, um, and is going to do all of my, my circus images and will print them. Yes? So the question was, how long did I spend uh, photographing? I wanted to go immediately after the fire, but um, they, they just don't let you go because of all the fumes. And, and, um, but somehow we uh, were able to get in about three days later. Um, most people don't go back, um, or they send um, an adjuster which is a new person in our lives, uh, a person that goes around and says, well, let's see what you had. Um, and so I would go early in the morning, beautiful light, and then I would just, um, people started to make these sifting boxes um, in the wineries, so with, with wooden and um, in their crates, and so we would look. And so I would go every day, and um, sometimes with my husband, sometimes with my children, friends, a couple of friends. A lot of people called and said, do you want any help? And so, but it was very, the, it, the fire, it took about a month for it to be contained. I don't know if you know that, about an actual month for the Atlas Peak fires to be totally contained. So it was pretty toxic, just if we were leaving the Bay Area and that sort of thing. But I would go, and uh, just when I thought I wouldn't find anything, I would find something. And so I would say daily for months. And then um, wonderful FEMA comes out, comes out and says, it's time. And so they start scraping everything away. And I'll have to tell you that that was the, 
that, I remember that day, it was a very, very tough day. Because before, at least, I had these items that were destroyed. There was a, a, a place. But now there was, they were just taking the, you know, the big, um, not tractors, but bulldozers and, and taking everything away. And that was, that was tough. It was interesting. So again, you see, I was attaching some of those things to, to memories, which is why I say that I didn't lose, I didn't lose things. I lost my home. I lost my memory. Yes? Do, do you now think of what, taking these photographs as your therapy? Um, yeah, I would. I think that in my case, and I've always felt that art saves lives, I really believe that. I believe that if you're, if you're blessed to be gifted creativity, which I think everybody does, but you really tap into that, and you use your camera, you write, um, you join alliances, um, you know, it did. It did, because, you know, this thing that's interesting is my studio was in my home. So unlike some people that can go to a studio, my home was the studio. So my daughter goes back to high school, my husband go back, so goes back to the hospital. So what do I do? So I was having this kind of crisis about identity and where do I go? I don't have a dark room, I don't have a desk, I don't have a camera, I don't have film. So. Those are, the, it's interesting, it's not the moment, but afterwards, is, you know, which, um, and so people have asked me, uh, what would you take? A lot of people now are asking themselves, it makes them question what they would take. And so I've heard just the funniest stories, actually. Somebody said they went in, and they went in their closet, and they just put their arms around a bunch of clothes, and then they took them, and they thought, what did I do, do, do that? <laughs> it's like, it made no sense. Or the thing, do you remember, I know some of you do, you remember those two for one uh, photographs and everybody would be like, oh my goodness gracious, if I get one more photograph, because you would get two of the same. Well, guess what? They've come in very handy because the people that I've shared the photographs with are sending me photographs. And so oftentimes I get home with a packet of photographs. Those photographs that all of you have somewhere in boxes, um, I, I would suggest to you to send some of those photographs to people, just literally go in there and just send them to people, hey, remember this and that, because that really, um, I don't know, they gave me some hope, there was something, because you really don't need, you know, 800 photographs of your child, do you know what I mean? You pretty much need a couple, right, which is one of the reasons why I think in the digital world, which is really what's very hard to negotiate is there are thousands of images that that you don't print anymore and so and I'm not saying print them but you you don't want to delete them right because you don't want to you don't know and so then you've got to build more you know more memory and that sort of thing so we're in this kind of cycle um, so um, yeah so I it did it saved me Um, great question. I, I have one and somehow it's not the way, oh I'm sorry. So the question is what image did, did I, um, was one of my favorite images. I would say that there was one, fo an actual photograph, I don't have it here, but I have a photograph that I found of my two older children and a little friend and they were sitting in the steps of my house. And that's the only photograph that survived out of all those hundreds and you know, thousands of photographs. So, I mean, it spoke to me. Um, so that was, was that. Um, there was one you can see here in the middle of a little pen of a, of a clown. That was one of my favorite pieces. So, you know, I found a lot more than this, um, but, and, it w and even then, this is how crazy it is, even then, um, I, because I finally moved into a house um, 10 days ago, <coughs> into a home, <coughs> and um, I didn't want to throw away this box of like 
at one point I just threw everything in these plastic bins, and I didn't. Even, I st I'm st I still have that, which is crazy. Because again, you know, if you're a collector, and it's hard to let go of your memories, you're going to keep even that things that were destroyed. Yes. Does anybody provide like the community provide grief counseling? For, I mean, there were many artists in that area, right? That were right. So, so the question is that the community provide any grief counseling? Um, they, it, they actually did. They, um, the, the arts councils um, would get together and they reached out to people, uh, provide possibly, um, you know, uh, materials and that sort of thing. So there was a lot of support. And that's, that, that's I don't know if that's Napa Valley or, because um, it was smaller, it was more contained. The thing that I think is very sad and it was, it was very post-traumatic was Paradise a year later. I don't know if you that that was pretty pretty epic, and that's that that was terrible. And I, I'll tell you that you know sometimes when you're in the moment you don't have that experience, but um, that was pretty tough for a lot of people who went through the fire. Yes. I was in Los Angeles visiting a friend that week, uh, first week of October. Right. And the one day the Santa Ana went through, and I finally realized what it was. Right. Yeah, the, the, the wind, so the question, um, the, the question also is about the, the temperature. It was interesting, um, that morning we found out that the winds were coming. And so I'm from the Midwest, so I'm thinking, what, what wind? I'm used to like tornadoes and, and that sort of thing. But it turned out that that particular day it was really very weird. It was a weird um, amount of, um, of wind and what happens when it's that windy is everybody gets spooked because you realize if it's dry then that could ignite things and so our worst fears were made, made true. So, um, so one of the books that I started to embrace was Stitches. Do you know Annie Lamott's work? She's from the Bay Area. She's a beautiful writer and a philosopher. And one of the things that she, you know, she wrote, she says, sometimes after a disaster or great loss, when we are hanging on for dear life, we struggle to understand how we will ever be able to experience cohesion and safety again. And so I started to find, my, I found myself wanting to read. That was, that was the other thing. So I had no camera. We bear, everybody went to Target, by the way, <laughs> because that was the local, it was, a, it was very weird. Everybody went to Target that morning to get things. We all had our things. And w nobody was really talking. You're just trying to figure out like day to day. And so I think for me, I started to, to not think about the things, think about my memories, and then starting to, to read, you know, try to see about grief. Because you're right, I think it is about grief. Um, certainly, we're blessed that we didn't have somebody who, who passed away. But there was just a lot of destruction uh, with that. Um, and, it, and, and she says that when she did a, she did a, like a Sunday school uh, event, when she had asked the kids questions like, do you guys want to talk about, for example, the, the, what happened with the kids who were killed in the Newton firing? you know, the killings, and, or do you want to make art? And of course, the kids wanted to make art. So I think that it, it's, it became, I, I knew that, I knew it intellectually that, that the work was going to be something that, that, was, that I needed to, to, to work on. And I think that in a lot of ways, I chose um, to be not to be defined by it, but to be transformed by it. That was the choice I made. And I don't know where that comes from, but that was my, my particular journey. And in being, having the work out there, um, I think it gave a lot of people a lot of hope. They kept writing back to me, strangers, that they found the work to be very uplifting and very optimistic. And, uh, you know, and, and, and you would think literally it wouldn't be because there were destroyed items. But I think that they started to see what I saw, which was the memories of these things. that. That's obviously were about my life. So yes. What do you consider the objects of interest? Are they the objects? 
Um, they're like part of like an ar archaeological dig. Um, I actually have them in a vitrine in my house. It, it, and I have to tell you, it's very interesting because the circus is a, was a different experience, right? So I wanted them up on the wall. I thought, you know, they, were, they made me happy. But I actually had to really think and, and actually process with my, you know, with my husband and my daughter, like, do I put these up? I mean, I, I was struggling with that. Like, what do I do? Do right, but even me, even even knowing that I made a print and had them framed and they were seen, um, I struggled with putting them up. Does that make sense? Because I didn't know. I don't. I, I didn't know if I if they. I I didn't know how I was going to respond. But now that some of them are up. I feel pretty good about it. But the objects are fascinating because when I, when I found them, I didn't let a lot of uh, temperature hit them. So they're really beautiful and gray. And you know, if those same objects were left a month later, they would all be you know, probably brown and they would all be rusted. So I was able to kind of capture them. And there's this beauty about them. So what's the question? It's a creative process. Do you see the fire as creative or the art as a creative process? That that it was creative? Um I don't know if it did. Um I think I think it happened. I you know, I, I sit with being in a place similar to people in war. And you look at that, you look at that particularly on television, and you just don't know, how, how, what do you do? Where do you go? I mean, particularly in Syria and other places in the world. Um, I think it was just my path. I think it was my path. It was a, a path that I never thought I'd be taking, never in a million years. Um, and I think that because I'm very social and I had lots of friends and I have a community of photographers, they were curious about my process. And so I, I hope that uh, in seeing the work, it kind of liberates all of you. You feel more liberated, if that's possible. To really just, I mean, we do come from a, actually we are in a place where there's all this equipment. And I was in classes where it was very, very much about um, you know, lighting and, and the right amount of lighting and the equipment. But then I realized that in photography, if you look at the history of photography way back in the beginning, it was all experimental. It wasn't like somebody just fig figured it out. I mean, they probably had to go through many different exposures or uh, formulas or, and everybody was trying different things. So I think for me to do something if you will, that was seen in the art world was um, it, it just evolved for me. And I, and I, and I took charge of it because I also tell most people that I think if you have something to say, just say it and just stay with it. Just stay with it. Because you'll always find somebody who will either say, oh, that's great or not so great or I've seen that before or that's not going to work. And just keep going. So I think I think that that was my, my journey. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, how are you with uh, restarting everything? Well, um, so, so, good, good segue there, sir. <laughs> All right. So, so, no, so now what? Um, so I'm back to analog. It's analog. And this is a photograph of me when I was a little girl and I lived in Puerto Rico. And that's my brother. And obviously I'm in some little studio. I don't recall exactly, but it was in the middle of the island in the Midwest in a place called Lares, Puerto Rico. And as life would have it, I was preparing before the fire, 
to go to Puerto Rico because guess what was happened in Puerto Rico? Hurricane Maria. So I was going to go to Puerto Rico with a backdrop. Um, let me show you a couple more images and then I'll explain the backdrop. With this backdrop, that stand, and I was going to get on a plane and I was going to go to Puerto Rico and photograph. Because I have this project called Forget Me Not, where I photograph everyday people, very old school, available light, house of lot, I hope, you know, film, and I shoot. And I've shot many people from Shanghai Jews to, um, I photograph, you know, um, my husband right after surgery, um, you know, uh, an art collector, a little girl, actually her brother's here in the back, um, who, um, you know, did hula dancing. And so I would photograph, uh, and I also photographed Francis Ford Coppola, and then I would photograph everyday people. And so I thought I'd go to Puerto Rico with my backdrop and start photographing all those amazing people and talking about their story. But my, but my backdrop burned. My stand burned. My prints burned. These prints burned. So luckily, I had digitized these images just by chance. I had wanted to put, you know, do a digital of these images, of family uh, images, because they were very, very small group of images. They were not very, you know, I didn't have a very, you know, it was a very um, modest family. And so these were all kind of immigration photos, you know, photographs that they would send to the States regarding their lives. So that's my project. So I actually had uh, my backdrop painted exactly how it was. Um, I'm working on the stand. And then um, I have firefighters now, um, you know, people from the fire, heroes. I mean, I, it's, it's endless who I can photograph. And so I'm going to continue doing that. And that's going to be my next book called Forget Me Not. Any questions about this project? Besides the fact that it's ambitious. <laughs> so, so this is the journey. So I go back to it, like, 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 like I hadn't lost a step. Yes. So when are we going to Puerto Rico? <laughs> so that's a good question. So um, in the fall, never in the summer, but um, I'm going to go there because. Um, the day that we found out my, that we lost our home, I was finally able to reach my aunt from one of those cell towers that she was okay, the family was okay. And she said in Spanish, you know, Linda, como estas? You know, está bien? And I said, I lost my house. And she just couldn't believe it. And I was worried about her. So it was an interesting time between Puerto Rico and that. So don't even get me started about Puerto Rico. And, uh, and the response. But I hope to create some art from that um, and then see if there's some money for, for the arts there because everything else was destroyed. Yeah, yeah, well, that, that's, a, that's another n a huge topic. Um, it, um, you know, it's like everything else, you know, if, if you don't know how to um, kind of negotiate through a system just like health, just like everything else, I mean, it's pretty daunting. And I have to say that one of the other toughest things for us was, was um, I don't, if, if you can believe this, but part of an insurance company is once you do an inventory of everything. And I'm talking about when they say everything, and they give you a sample on a spreadsheet like, how many cups did you have? How many glasses did you have? How many spoons did you have? I mean, they get crazy. So, so I, we had to go through that. We were fortunate, um, as we're fortunate now, that we, were, we had good insurance. But a lot of people were, un I would say the majority of people are underinsured. I bet you all here, you're underinsured. Because who wants to pay more insurance, right? Or if you acquire things after so many years, so we lived there for 30 years, I mean, you don't go, oh, yeah, I got a print, and I have this and that, and, 
you know, you don't, you don't think that way. It's not how we think. So, um, and now uh, PG&E is just, they just um, um, went into bankruptcy or trying to negotiate. It's not, it's title, I think it's sef chapter seven to negotiate. So there's just a lot of um, unfortunate some things going on with that, with the company in, in federal, in the federal court. So, um, but they have to do the right thing. That's the problem is that a lot of people um, lost everything and jobs and it's, it's just terrible. So, but yeah, so um, uh, I would recommend you have a good, good discussion with your insurance agent if that's possible. Yes. Actually, it's the H7, is it? It's the two and a quarter. Can you tell I'm very technical? It's not the square. Yeah, six, yeah, I have that. And it turns out that, that I had that because that was the one thing. Because my garage and the garage next to the garage was my studio. I don't know why. Because I wasn't thinking that we were not going to not come back. But I took it. It was like, because it was right there. It was like I just grabbed it and I put it in the car. I have my old, old house blog, yes. So, so film I have, and then I'm going to start shooting. It's it's interesting. It's it's more my nature to to do, shoot anyway film. So, any other questions? Yes. Have they rebuilt the house? Uh, no, in our case, we um, ended up buying a home. So completely brand new. Right. We bought another home because a lot of people, um, you know, it's interesting. Initially, I think with all these disasters, everybody comes out and says, oh, we're all going to help you. It's going to be fine and that sort of thing. But when it's said and done, you still have to do it with the county. I don't think it's as bad as New York City building anything, but it's pretty daunting. And I don't, one of the things that's interesting when rebuilding is you have to do everything to code. Just, you could be in a building that was 50 years old, but when, you're, when it's time to rebuild, they want you to build to code. So that's been an issue. So we thought about it. We have a teenage daughter, and we thought, you know, we're not going to spend the rest. I wanted, uh, we just decided to, to buy a home. Yes? I'm, I'm very inspired by your story. I, I'm wondering if you're going to do a book about the fire engine. So the question is, do I do something about the fire images? Yes. Um, I know I'll be in a book uh, because there's some people writing about climate change. I did talk to somebody, and I can tell that they thought the work was dark. I kind of I, I, I feel it's very inspiring because you can make something good out of the tragedy. Right. Right. Yeah, so I haven't, I haven't, and they're all now digital, and they're all ready to print, and people have collected the work, which is interesting. They've gone and collected my prints. It's interesting the choices people make, like they'll want, like, like um, the pearls, or they'll want um, a camera image. How the series, the gloves and the objects, how, yep. many, how many total, total? Um, so I, I have a series called trays, so they're the tray images, and then I would say about 75. I filled I filled the the space, and yeah, thank you. I feel encouraged. <laughs> a small book, right? Yeah, 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 and maybe some stories, hopefully, with that. So, yes. Norma, you helped us understand a little bit about about tangible loss, and we all have that. Right. Either because of a man-made disaster, national, natural disaster. I guess understanding what to do with that kind of tangible loss is one thing. But then, what would you leave us with in terms of how to deal with any other kind of spiritual loss? How do you, how do you think we should? prepare ourselves spiritually or intellectually? Hmm. 
I think that that's in you. I think the way we cope, and I and I haven't been spared. You know what what's what was fascinating for me was that I couldn't. You can't. I, for my story, somebody else can top it. Somebody else can give me a a more I don't know horrible story or a sadder story. It, it, it's I I can't. You know. So so I think. I think spiritually, I think it's about a sense of community, about faith, um, about creativity, um, um, about um, about a sense of the world. I mean, I really, n not that I needed a lot of education on that, because I think I'm, I'm just innately in that space. But um, I started to think about just kind of the, the, the beauty, and I continue to do that. So, um, and um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for being here.